Judges chapter 12 is a little bit of a shorter passage, but we're finishing the story of, uh, of the judge Jephthah. Of course, last week was a pretty incredible story, and we saw how that ended up with him keeping the vow that he vowed where he, uh, he vowed that he would offer up his whatever, whatever met him when he returned home from the battle, if God would just deliver the Ammonites into his hand and he, and he came home and um, found his daughter came out to greet him and of course she and he ended up keeping his vow to God and a very sad, very sad story. Now, we pick up here in Judges chapter 12 and just imagine this, you know, he's already had to deal with that. He had a great victory, but overall it's an overwhelming loss for him personally because the military victory is nothing, I would sure, in his personal life compared to his only child um, being offered up then as, as that sacrifice due to, due his, to his own foolish vow. And um, that's devastating enough, but what we see here in, at the very beginning in chapter 12 is now he's being confronted with his own brethren, the, the, the children of the, the tribe of Ephraim, are giving him a hard time. And look at what it says here in verse number one. The Bible says, And the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and went northward and said unto Jephthah, Wherefore passest thou over to fight against the children of Ammon, and didst not call us to go with thee? We will burn thine house upon thee with fire. That's pretty extreme, right? They're saying, why didn't you, you know, you went up and you fought this battle and you fought against Ammon and you didn't call us up. Why didn't you call us up? You know what? Now we're just going to, we're going to burn you with fire inside of your house. We're going to burn your house down with you inside of it. I mean, a guy just lost, just lost his child. He had this great victory, right? Hey, how about praise God? for the victory that you've given us, that, that God has given us over the people who have been oppressing us. No, that's not the attitude at all. It's, why didn't you have us go with you? Now, this isn't a unique instance with the, with the people of Ephraim either. If you remember, flip back to Judges chapter 8. Keep your place here. Just flip back a couple pages. We're going to see in Judges chapter 8, verse number 1, Gilead had to deal with the same exact thing. Or excuse me, Gideon, not Gilead. Gideon had to deal with the same exact attitude with the children of Ephraim. Verse number 1 in Judges chapter 8 says, And the men of Ephraim said unto him, Why hast thou served us thus, that thou callest not us not, when thou wentest to fight with the Midianites? And they did chide with him sharply. So they seem to have this attitude now, granted, some years have gone by, but not that many. This isn't some huge time frame between Gideon and, um, and Jephthah. And these, these people of Ephraim, they just have this, this big chip on their shoulder. And, you know, they're also like these big talkers, right? Like, well, if I was, you know, why didn't you, you know, after the fact, oh, well, well, how come you didn't come and get me, right? The battle's already over. Well, well why didn't you call me to fight? Right? And you know the, the, the tough guy type of an attitude of people who want to jump on after all the fighting's already done. Oh man, if I was there, you should have seen what I would have done. You know, I wouldn't have let those guys, you know. It's, it's the people who are like, oh man, if I was there when Goliath was, was confronting everybody, pff, yeah, I would have gone up and I would have I killed that guy. David just got to him first, right? <laughs> And Jephthah even tells these guys in, in verse number two, it says, And Jephthah said unto them, I and my people were at great strife with the children of Ammon, and when I called you, ye delivered me not out of their hands. So they're saying, why didn't you call us? Why didn't you? And Jephthah's saying, I did call you, and you basically left me to myself. Where were you then? Where were you when I needed you and you called you? And now you're saying, oh, why didn't you call us? Why didn't you have us come and help you? Now, the Bible doesn't specifically tell us who's lying here, but it's obvious that someone is because you've got the children of Ephraim saying you didn't call us and you've got Jephthah saying I did call you. I don't know about you, but I think I'd probably take the word of Jephthah over the children of Ephraim when the children of Ephraim have already been known to have this type of an attitude in the past 
and when we can see that Jephthah is a man of his word. That Jephthah is a man that when he said something, he meant it. And that's already been demonstrated. I think Jephthah is in the right here. Now, before we get even any further in this, I, I want to, you know, I, I think that the children of Ephraim are really wicked. And I think that's obvious with the way that they're just going after him and confronting him and saying, well, why didn't you call us? We're going to burn. Think about, think about how wicked that is. We're going to burn your house down with you inside of it. And this is as, as a result of a great victory for the Lord. God brings the victory. Jephthah leads the way. God brings the victory. You'd think they'd be happy about that, as I mentioned earlier. But what, what are they interested in? Themselves. What are they interested in? The glory. They're interested in causing problems. If their heart was right, first of all, they would never say to Jephthah, we're going to burn you inside of your house and, and, and burn you up inside of that and just, and just destroy you. For what? For nothing. We're going to, like I said, I'm going to get in a little bit further about how wicked they are. But what I want to hit on now is you may not be that wicked like the children of Ephraim are, but you got to make sure that you're getting involved in things and you have the right spirit and you're in it for the right reasons. They didn't care about the end goal. They cared about themselves. They cared about the glory. They, oh, he won this victory, so now Jephthah's going to get all this glory and, gl and Jephthah's going to be one everyone looks to. Well, we wanted to be a part of that. We wanted to be there fighting with you. Why didn't you call us? And the reason why they're even saying that is because they just want the glory. They're causing these problems at home instead of just doing their own thing. And here's the thing that everybody needs to understand. When you are serving the Lord, when you are going to do, you know, great things for God, you may never get recognition. You may never be in the, in the spotlight or in the glory. Yeah, right. Think about the disciples of Jesus Christ. Think about the 12, you know, there's 12 disciples. Obviously, one of them was a traitor. There's 11 good disciples. But how many of those disciples do we even read about? We know all their names. But you probably hear about three or four of them more than everybody else. I mean, Thomas gets a mention, but it's not the best mention, but he's one of the 12. And, I, and you know what? I think Thomas did a lot of great things for the Lord. There was one thing that, that people learned from him, but he was one, I mean, he stuck with Jesus through thin and thick. When Jesus was, was at, his, at the, the height of his ministry and had the most people following him and, and the most work being done and everything else, but he was also there at the low points when everyone's turning around. Wow, this is a hard saying. Oh, man, we're offended. I don't think I could stay here anymore. I don't want to listen to this guy anymore. And Jesus is like, are you going to go too? But no, his, his, all of his disciples stuck with him. They were there. You may not be the Peter, the James, or the John. That might not be the work that God has for you individually. You might be the Simon the Canaanite. You might be, you know, any of the other disciples or people that have served God and throughout the centuries have served the Lord in all sincerity and have done great things for God and no one even knows their name. And you know what? That's just fine by me. And hopefully that's just fine by you. And if you happen to be seeing somebody else and they're getting all this glory and all this attention and they're, and they're doing the good work, and they're, they're serving the Lord, then praise God for that. Amen. Amen. No one should have a wicked heart or a wicked attitude thinking, oh, well, why isn't that me? Oh, I want to be the one getting all the attention. Oh, I, you know, and then to the point of, of attacking the person who's getting attention instead of praising God, hey, there's some good stuff being done. Unfortunately, you get people who get a little bit too proud and their heart is not right with the Lord and they care more about who they are and what people can see them as as opposed to the glory and the credit and honor and everything going unto God. I've seen this happen I've, and I'll teach on this at, the, at, my, at my preaching classes that we teach here. 
but it's, it's very relevant for what we're talking about tonight. And, and you know, young men, you got to get this in your head. If you do have any desire to be a minister, whether that's a pastor or just a preacher or, you know, doing any other type of ministry, serving the Lord in whatever capacity it is, don't be going into it thinking, I want to be the next, you know, Pastor Anderson or John R. Rice or who, whoever your hero is, whoever it is that has gotten lots of attention and gotten the spotlight. Now, if you're, if you're striving to be, hey, I want to do as much work as these people, great, right? If they did a lot of work and you want to follow an example and, and be someone who's, who the Lord can use to do a lot of work, great. But don't be worried about the attention. Don't be worried about the spotlight. Don't be worried about how many people know your name. Because that doesn't matter. Because the whole point of ministering is how many people know the name of Jesus. It's not how many people know the name David Burzens. I don't care if people ever remember my name or know my name. It's not about me. It's not about you. That's what ministering is. That's what service is. And even when you preach, you know, don't, it's, it's not about what's the most shocking thing I can say that's going to go viral on the internet that everybody's going to look at and, you know, be careful, with, you know, preach the truth, don't hold back. Preach fiery sermons, preach the truth that needs to be out there, say what needs to be said, but you don't need to change it to the point to where now everyone's just focused on you. That is the wrong attitude, and Ephraim took this to the extreme. Because they didn't care about the victory at all. They just cared about them not being in it. We ought to rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. And when our brothers and sisters are in a fight and they're in a great battle and they're getting a victory, hey, praise God. I don't mind being... The support. I mean, maybe, you know, off, when you see people doing great works and, and there's a figurehead, it's never just that one person that's getting all of the work done. They have people supporting them. There are lots of people behind the scenes, you know, big events that are going on. Yeah, there's certain people that get the spotlight and that's just the way it is. Just like the Bible talks about with members within the body, you know, some members may appear more comely than others. Some, some members get more focus or more attention from the outside, but they're all necessary. Everyone needs to be there. They all need to be there doing their job in order for the best works to be done. So, so don't forget that and don't get an Ephraimite type of an attitude. Let's continue on in the chapter here. So Jephthah tells them in verse 2, hey, I already called you. Where were you? You know, I really needed you. And see, these are the friends that they're, they're the fair weather ones that, you know, kind of like when, um, when Gideon was going, was going after the, the Midianites, Ephraim was like the people who were like, well, I don't know, where, you know, are they in your hand yet? I don't know, we'll see. I don't really want to help you out until then. And then they're going to talk all tough afterwards. You should have been there to help out, but they didn't care about helping his, their brother. And later on, we're going to see that, well, real soon here, in a couple of verses, we're going to see what more they just said to, to Jephthah and just disdained him and ridiculed him. Verse number three says, And when I saw that you delivered me not, I put my life in my own hands, or in my, in my hands, and passed over against the children of Ammon. And the Lord delivered them into my hand. Wherefore then are you come up unto me this day to fight against me? He's like, hey, when you didn't help me, I took my life in my own hands. I took matters in my own hands. You're not going to be there. You know what? I'm going to do something about it. So what's the problem with that? And when I went and did something about it, God delivered them. God got the victory. You didn't help me. I had to go and do this alone. God wrought the battle. He wrought the victory. Where's the problem? Why are you coming up to fight against me today? But the, the wicked Ephraim, Ephraimites at this time they didn't care about that. Verse 4 says, Then Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. And the men of Gilead smote Ephraim because they said, Ye Gileadites are fugitives of Ephraim among the Ephraimites and among the Manassites. Now, they reviled them. They're basically saying, Oh yeah, you, you men of Gilead, 
you know, you're, you're just these fugitives. You're not, you're not true children of Ephraim or Manasseh. You're not true children of Joseph. You're, you're just this, this, this rogue group. You, um, you know, you, you're, you've gone off, you're fugitives, and you're just living among the Manassites, but you're, you're, not, you're not genuine. Now, remember, Jephthah was born of a harlot. So I'm sure that those words probably cut kind of deep for him personally on a personal level. It's probably a sore spot for him. But I'll tell you what, I don't think that he necessarily acted the way that he should have either. Ephraim was definitely wrong, there's no doubt about that. No question at all about Ephraim just being wrong. But what happened when Ephraim had the same type of an attitude against Gilead? Gilead treated it differently. See, there's nothing inherently sinful or, or even necessarily wrong with what Jephthah said. And say, well, hey, well, you know, I, I went and I did this, right? It seems like a pretty normal response. What, what do I have to do with it? But he could have had more wisdom in diffusing the situation. And this is a skill in leadership that really needs to be learned and learned well. The Bible tells us in the book of Proverbs, verse 15, chapter 15, verse number 1, a soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir, stir up anger. Go back to, um, actually flip over to 1 Peter chapter 2. Actually, no, let's go back to, to Judges 8. We are going to 1 Peter chapter 2, so if you already got there, put a bookmark there. But flip back real quick to Judges chapter 8 because I just want to real quickly review what we, we went over a few weeks ago of how Gilead dealt with Ephraim when they said in verse 1 of chapter 8, you know, why hast thou served us thus that thou callest us not when we went as to fight with the Midianites and they did chide with him sharply. So they're, they're disdaining Gilead. They're using their words to try to, to, to pick a fight with Gilead over the same exact scenario. Well, when they're using their words against Jephthah to pick a fight with them, Jephthah takes the bait and he kills a whole bunch of them and, and we see that, but Gilead didn't do that. Look at verse number two, Judges chapter eight, Gilead, it says in verse two, and he said unto them, what have I done now in comparison of you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abiezer? God hath delivered into your hands the princes of Midian, Oreb and Zeb. And what was I able to do in comparison of you? Then their anger was abated toward him when he had said that. So he gave them a soft answer. He didn't come back all, all strong and, and, and hard against them going, you know, like, well, who do you think you are? Which, yeah, you can be justified in saying that, right? Because they were in the wrong. But as a leader, he was able to see this isn't going to go very well. And what do I want to do? Do I want to get in a war? Do I want to get in some big fight with my brethren? Or can I just remain humble and just say, hey, you, you guys... You guys did a great work. You know, I, you, you, there's lots of ways of dealing with these situations to where it doesn't have to come to this big conflict and a big fight and a big war and a lot of people dying. And, it's, and, and again, I'm not trying to say that like Jephthah was just completely wrong with everything here because he's, he's justified in being in the right that he was wrong. But there's just different ways, you know, there's different outcomes and different ways of dealing with things. And I think that's one thing we can learn from this. And the reason why I'm hesitant to go too far with, with just condemning Jephthah is just because of how wicked Ephraimites are at this point. And we're going to see that as we get further in the chapter. But there's definitely something to be learned for how you deal with situations. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to get a little bit from, uh, from God's word here in the New Testament about how our attitude ought to be in difficult situations. I mean, it's a difficult situation. He's got, he's got these people, you know, threatening to kill him that are his brethren, and they're saying all kinds of mean things that are, hit, that are striking a nerve with him. They're hitting a sore spot. 
They're, they're demeaning him. They're bringing him down. He already has problems going on at home. He's, he's grieving over his child. He doesn't need this. But the Bible still teaches us how, we ought, how our spirit ought to be, even in situations like that when things are really difficult. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 19. The Bible says, For this is thankworthy. If a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. It was wrong for the children of Ephraim to go up against Jephthah. So he's suffering wrongfully already by them in, in everything that they're saying and doing unto him. Look at verse 20. For what glory is it if when you be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. He's saying, you know, if you do something wrong and, and you're punished for it and you're suffering, well, you should take it patiently, but you're not going to, you're not like getting any great rewards over that because you did wrong, right? So you getting punished over what you're doing, something wrong, yeah, you brought that on yourself. But when you didn't do anything wrong and you're serving God and people are still treating you really poorly, but you can take it patiently. You can take it. You can roll with it. You don't have to speak evil for evil and railing for railing. You can just take it and deal with it in humility, that, the Bible says, is acceptable with God. Verse number 21, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Jesus is the best example for this. I mean, think about someone who did not ever deserve any type of disdain, any type of ill treatment, anything spoken, even one word spoken against him. Jesus Christ didn't deserve that ever, not one time. But he was a man of sorrows. He was well acquainted with grief, the Bible says. He was hated. He was despised. He came unto his own and his own received him not. He was persecuted, rejected. He, he, he traveled around and people were constantly trying to kill him, trying to trap him in his words and rejecting all of the good that he was doing. The gospel he's preaching, he's healing people, he's saving people, he's doing this great work and yet he's still spit upon and whipped and beaten up and, you know, and ultimately hung on the cross. And how did Jesus respond to all of that? He didn't respond when people, you know, yelled some curse at him. He didn't just yell some curse back. He took it. He suffered it. That is the example that we have to look to and to live by. I don't think the children of Ephraim, honestly, and maybe, and maybe I'm wrong because I'm, maybe I'm reading into it too much. They said that they, oh, we're going to burn you and your house down. They probably wouldn't have done it. Don't know, right? But if it, if it were just words, you need to just let that stuff roll off you and, and, not, and not let it get to you and just keep doing what's right. If all they're doing is using, you just using these words, right, and trying to pick a fight, don't, don't fall for that. Don't get involved with that. Flip over to chapter 3 in 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3. Verse number eight, the Bible says, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love his brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise, blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. And that's exactly how Gideon dealt with Ephraim. And when they're reviling him, he blessed them. Well, hey, what can I do compared to you? You, got, you guys did a great job. You guys deserve the credit. That's, that's how Gideon dealt with it. And you know what? Their anger was abated. They cooled off and the soft answer turned away wrath. Verse number 10, For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. We, we ought to be seeking peace. You know, I brought this up before when we go out soul winning, you get confronted when people get agitated. 
whether it be security at an apartment complex or even just somebody at the door that's just really angry for you being there, we need to seek peace. Yeah, We're not trying to get into physical confrontations and fights. Yes, we stand our ground morally and with our mission and our purpose and serving the Lord. Of course. We're going to keep preaching the gospel. I'm not saying not to preach the gospel, but we can speak when people are coming at you and maybe berating you and belittling you and talking down to you. Don't let that stir up your anger and wrath and get your heart. And don't go home thinking, you know, this bitterness Man, I can't believe they said that to me. I can't believe they did that to me. I know that happens. Look, it's happened to me a bunch of times. But don't dwell on that stuff. It's just going to turn your heart bitter. Right. It's going to turn your heart bitter towards those people. But, you know, what did Jesus say when, to the people about the people that nailed him the cross? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. That's the example that Christ left us with. So even the person that might be reviling you out soul winning, you know what you ought to have in your heart for that person? Love. God, I hope that person gets saved. Yeah. God, if I can't give this person the gospel because they're angry with me, maybe someone else can. Yeah, that's right. that's, that is where our heart needs to be. It's not easy. But we need to work on it. Work on our heart. Think about these things. Think about the attitude that Christ has given us. Meditate on these scriptures where the Bible is telling us Seek peace and ensue it. What is the value in all these people being killed off? In, you know, in, the, in the case in Judges that we're reading. Or just in all these extra conflicts and fights that really aren't going to produce anything, anything good, anything useful out of it. Verse number 12, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. This is why we don't have to worry about it. God's face is against those people that do evil. God will deal with the ones that are your enemies, that are attacking you. Hey, that makes it all the more easy to let it slide off your back. Because Jephthah could just be like, you know what, I know I'm right with God. God could deal with you guys. God could hear what's going on. Verse number 14. Verse number 13. And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? But, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. He's saying, don't be afraid, don't let it bother you when they're, when they're coming at you and trying to make you scared. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Not fear of man, fear of God. Right. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as if evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. So yeah, they're going to try to speak evil about you and lie about you and slander you. They'll be ashamed. If you're doing what's right and you're walking uprightly, then they will be ashamed because there's going to be nothing that's going to stick. And just let them be ashamed. And you don't need to be the judge. Let God deal with it. Let's go back to Judges. Judges chapter 12. So, as I mentioned, I think Jephthah could have dealt with the situation better. He probably could have found a way to not have to destroy so many of those Ephraimites. Now, maybe he couldn't. Maybe they would have been persistent. Maybe they would have just continued to just make the fight happen. Because sometimes that happens too. And there's, you know, as much as you try, some people just won't let it go and you're forced to get into a conflict. Right. When you're not seeking it out, you want peace. And, you know, even Jephthah, I mean, he wasn't just antagonizing them. He was saying, well, what's the problem? Why, why are you so upset with me? But look at verse number five here because, um, but even in verse number four, it says, um, then Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim 
And Mev Gilead smote Ephraim, and, it's, and it says, because. So this is why he smote them. This is why he killed them. Because they said, ye Gileadites are fugitives of Ephraim. That's what got to him. They said something that he didn't like, so he's like, you know what? I'm going to go, we're going we're to kill you now. I know Ephraim came up against them to fight, but he could have dealt with this a little bit differently, a little bit better. Now, verses 5 and 6 are very interesting verses. And I'm going to tell you what I think about this, and I'm not, a, I'm not dogmatic about it because uh, I don't think you can be with the information given here. But let's read verses 5 and 6. The Bible says, And the Gileadites took the passages of Jordan before the Ephraimites. So, the passage of Jordan. Basically, Ephraim passed over Jordan because their inheritance was on the other side of Jordan. Manasseh was on the other side and Gilead was over there. And now, the, when, after they had destroyed a bunch of children of Ephraim, you know, most of them, they, they fled, they ran away, you know, they killed a bunch of them, but now they want to head back home. So basically, Gilead takes these, these crossings for Jordan where they're going to head back home. The, the main roadways or whatever, bridges, you know, to get back home. And they take these passages and, and they're just standing guard. They, they set up their checkpoint, right? Because they're looking now to, to get the rest of these Ephraimites that got away. It says, And Gileadites took the passage of Jordan before the Ephraimites, and it was so that when those Ephraimites, which were escaped, said, Let me go over, that the men of Gilead said unto him, Art thou an Ephraimite? So they're questioning people. Show me your papers. <laughs> Are you an Ephraimite? And if they said, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not an Ephraim. I just want, I just want to go over there. You know, I'm visiting some relatives and I just want to cross over here. I'm, I'm passing through. I'm going over to Dan, whatever. Right. And, uh, and if, so if they said no, then they had a test for him. Verse 6 says, Then said they unto him, Say now, Shibboleth. And this was their test. They say, If you want to pass over there, you say you're not of Ephraim, say Shibboleth. And he said, Sibboleth. <laughs> so apparently they couldn't say the S-H sound. Shh. For he could not frame to pronounce it right. Then they took him and slew him at the passages of Jordan, and there fell at that time of the Ephraimites 40 and 2,000. So a lot of people died. Now, I'm more inclined to think that this is probably more of like a cultural thing of them not being able to pronounce the word just based on their dialect from locally where they were, probably. But it's interesting that this is in here. And... I'm not ruling out this, and I'm actually going to show you why this could be valid as well, is that as, for as wicked as we saw these people were, that's why I kind of made a big deal out of it at the beginning, there's a good possibility that these Ephraimites were Sodomites. Now, again, I'm not super dogmatic about this, but think about the Sodomites that you hear, these flaming queers, how do they talk? They talk with a lith. Right? And they can't say, they can't pronounce things right. And you know what's kind of interesting? And I've wondered why is it that fags act the way that they do? I mean, just just so completely different. And yet the same. Like the, the group kind of kind of all acts the same. And I, I could only wonder, is this the way that when people are given over to this reprobate mind, that they've always behaved throughout history? And you notice it's kind of effeminate. And it makes sense to me that they probably have talked like that throughout history because they've become effeminate right. by being these sodomites. And the reason, the, the other reasons besides, because like, why would, like, like, why is this in Scripture? Why does it say, you have to say shibboleth, and they said sibboleth? It's telling us exactly the word that's being used. Like, this is some interesting detail for the story. It's there for a reason. 
And when you combine that, and you can turn to Romans chapter 1, when you combine that with the fact that these guys, for no good reason, came against Jephthah and threatened to burn him down in his house around him and just, and just completely destroy him, had absolutely no care for the things of God and literally only cared about themselves and they were lifted up with pride. They did not have mercy on him that his daughter was dead. They did not care about the things of God. Look at Romans chapter 1, verse number 29, when it talks about some of the attributes of the reprobate. The Bible says, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness. They're acting pretty maliciously towards Jephthah. Full of envy. They were definitely envious of his victory. Murder. They were willing to murder Jephthah. He didn't do anything wrong. Debate, deceit, malignity. They were maligning him. Saying, oh, you know, talking about where he was from, you know, you, you Gileadites and you know, we're just railing on them that way. Whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful. Again, they're, they're being very despiteful toward them. Proud, boasters, avengers of evil things, disobedient parents. Uh, and then at the end of verse 31, implacable and unmerciful. I'm not saying I can just apply all these based on the passage, but maliciousness, full of envy, murder, malignity, despiteful, implacable, unmerciful. All seem to be applicable to these people. And you say, but how could that be? They are the children of Israel. Well, wait till we get to Judges 19. We're in Judges 12. We're not that far off from Judges 19. We're going to see the tribe of Benjamin. No, this isn't, this isn't, I don't see any reason to think that that couldn't be the case. I can't say for sure that that is the case. But I do find it interesting that, that verse 6 is included in this story. And that that is the, the way that, that a lot of sodomites, male sodomites, speak today. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that you, if you ask them to say it, they probably couldn't. <laughs> I would say try it sometimes. You know, I, don't, I don't even want to have a conversation with these people. But I, I could imagine that they probably couldn't say Shibboleth. So I just, you know, I, I try to be careful with what I teach, especially from behind the pulpit. Right. But you've got to admit there's, some, there's, something, there's something there to it. So I'm not telling you that that dogmatically, that's, yes, that's what happened, but it, it, is, it is very something. It's something interesting and something I've definitely thought about a lot and um, just kind of wanted to pass that along. So let's go back here. Judges, we're almost done. I'm in Joshua. There we go. Judges. I was in Joshua 12. Verse number 7. The Bible says, And Jephthah judged Israel six years. Then died Jephthah the Gileadite and was buried in one of the cities of Gilead. So he didn't really end up judging Israel for very long. He only, he only was the judge for six years. And he died. And then and we're going to see a few more judges that came after him. Verse 8 says, And after him, Ibzan of Bethlehem judged Israel. And he had 30 sons and 30 daughters, whom he sent abroad and took in 30 daughters from abroad for his sons. And he judged Israel seven years. So this guy, again, didn't judge Israel for very long. The guy that followed Jephthah. And he doesn't really, because this is all the information we have, and we're going to see, like some of these judges, we don't get any information at all or very, very little. He just doesn't sound to be that good of a judge because it sounds like he's making affinity with the heathen by taking strange women unto his sons for wives. So what it says there in verse 9, it says he had 30 sons and 30 daughters. He sent his daughters abroad, meaning he sent them away out like to foreign countries and took in 30 daughters from abroad for his sons. So he's this judge and he's bringing in daughters from elsewhere, from, from out, I think abroad, it's going to mean out of the country, just from other places, from, from all around, from the heathen to marry his 30 sons. And, um, this is something that people in power often did. You know, kings, he wasn't a king, but he was a judge. He was, he was ruling over, 
over Israel at this time. And this is how they kind of make pacts and treaties and they, they get their families close to try to help them remain in power, right? Because they make these powerful friends and, oh, you know, you can marry my daughters and my son's going to marry your daughters and they will get close together. And, and that's what it looks like that this guy did. But again, he only, he only judged Israel for seven years. He didn't seem to be that good of a judge. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 7, I'll just read this for you. Deuteronomy 7, verse 1, When the Lord thy God shall bring thee into the land, whither thou goest to possess it, and hath cast out many nations before thee, the Hittites, and the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Hitt Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and mightier than thou. And when the Lord thy God shall deliver them before thee, thou shalt smite them and utterly destroy them. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor show mercy unto them. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them, thy daughter, Thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter shalt thou take unto thy son. For they will turn away thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. If a man doesn't know how to rule his own house, in the sense that he's bringing in these strange wives of the heathen of the land to marry his sons, I don't think he was probably a very good judge of the nation either. Amen. And this is all the information we have to go of, but, but God's word is very clear about that. Even in just pastoring a church, which is a way, 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 way smaller amount of authority, uh, you know, realm of authority, that's the way that God views that. Hey, you need to be able to rule your house well. How can you take care of the church of, you know, church of God? How about ruling a nation? I mean, that, that's, that's a lot of people. And then here we have a guy with 30 sons. You know, I'm just going to bring in all these strange women for you to marry. Just let your hearts be turned away. And yeah, that was, I quoted that from Deuteronomy chapter 7. The judges had Deuteronomy chapter 7. And in fact, they didn't have a whole lot. So you'd think they'd know that even more. Right. And when we've got more Bible to learn today than they had to learn then. So there's no excuse for that. Bible says here in verse 10, Then died Ibzan and was buried at Bethlehem. And after him, Elon, a Zebulonite, judged Israel. And he judged Israel 10 years. And Elon, the Zebulonite, died and was buried in Aijalon, in the country of Zebulun. And after him, Abdon, the son of Hillel, a Parathonite, judged Israel. And he had 40 sons and 30 nephews that rode on three score and ten ass colts. And he judged Israel eight years. And Abdon, the son of Hillel, the Parathonite, died and was buried in Parathon in the land of Ephraim in the mount of the Amalekites. So a couple decades later, we have an Ephraimite now coming to be a judge. And that's what, what this last one is here, Abdon, um, the son of Hillel, a Parathonite. And it uh, calls him a Parathonite and then tells us that um, Par Pirathon was in the land of Ephraim. So it's easy to deduce he was an Ephraimite. But... In the next chapter, we're going to see, so we get this real short history with the years. You know, the years add value, and I'm not going to teach on that just in general for, for understanding length of time from one thing to another. And there's not much things remarkable about these other judges, but, you know, the history is just being preserved here. This many years, this many years, this many years. And um, that in and of itself has its own value. And then next week, we're going to get started into the stories of Samson. So another few chapters of some really cool stories and, and a lot of interesting things to learn. So don't make sure not to miss next week. And let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for all the things that we could learn in the Scripture, Lord. I pray that you would please open up our minds, our understanding, and our hearts to the great truths of the Bible. And I pray that you please help us to be diligent in, in reading our Bibles every day, and um, Lord, lead us in the right path. Help us to have the right spirit about us, the right heart, that we wouldn't um, be reviling people when they revile us or give cursing for cursing, but rather blessing and that we can truly follow the example that Christ left for us. Lord, help us to be able to do that. Help us to put our flesh aside. Help us to be able to walk in the spirit regularly, Lord. Um, we need your strength. We need your help and help us to encourage one another 
in, in the, the daily battle that we have against our flesh and um, against the people that hate you, Lord. So in Jesus' name we pray, amen.